TYT would like to thank Squarespace for making possible our coverage of the 2017 Oslo Freedom Forum. Whether you need a website, a domain, or an online store, make your next move with Squarespace. You can start your free trial at squarespace.com slash TYT and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. Layla Hussein, who is one of the speakers at the Oslo Freedom Forum this year, and her, we're going to talk about vaginas. And it's, I'm not even saying that flippantly, this woman <laughs> has been a rabble rousing campaigner for how many years now? Uh, 15 years, coming up to, I, I always say the campaign is same age as my daughter, so my daughter's about to become 15. Yeah. And for me, this all started when I was pregnant with her, so that's really, I'll go way back. Okay, so I think for a lot of people, the idea of female genital mutilation, which is Layla's kind of raison d'etre, this is her cause, um, that seems so alien. They don't know what it means. It immediately turns people off. They glaze over. It seems like something that happens far away. It's a terrible thing. Talk me through what FGM is and then like why you've taken this on as like your life's work. So female genital mutilation, it's partial or total removal of the female genital, uh, genital, uh, genitalia for non-medical reasons. And it's either pricking or cutting of the female genitalia where at times they close the whole genital and they're left with a very small opening. You're expected to urinate, menstruate, um, have intercourse and give birth at some point. So you can imagine already how, I mean, I don't even like to use the word cause to be honest because cause is something you make a choice. Of, there isn't a cause to end murder or sexual abuse. So, and I'm very specific about language. I mean, the reason this became it became my life work by accident, I would say, because for me it was about protecting my child from this. I have a daughter who was born in the UK, but I was in a similar situation as her. I grew up in the West most of my life, so I was that child who necessarily should not have, who have undergone this practice. Even though by then my family was against the practice, the question that wouldn't leave me was, what if I was under pressure? And why didn't my midwife, because my midwife, even though she could see I had a scar, she didn't, even, I mean, I consider myself to be the lucky ones. I didn't have the severe type, but I had a scar, but she never said anything. So there was, there was something that was niggling at me that said, oh my God, I'm not valued. I am being ignored. And I started asking a lot of questions to organizations and I was reading a lot. And then I found everybody kept using the word religion, culture, and clearly it doesn't say in any of the holy books, you know, it's practiced by all religions, it's not just one religion. I said, no one's using the word child abuse, why is that? I mean, I really, and when I spoke to other campaigners and colleagues, they freaked out by saying, oh my God, don't say it, don't use that word, you're going to alienate the community, blah, blah, blah. So all of a sudden I became a troublemaker. So I, a lot of people didn't want to work with me at one point. So it's quite isolating position to be in. So I was number one, 22 at the time. So I was considered, oh, look at this young girl from the diaspora, wanted to end FGM. Now she wants to come with her privilege and call it child abuse. And I said, well, so a lot of people saying to me, but you are from the West, you haven't been through this. So for me, I had to come out and tell my story. So right. people needed to know that it actually does happen to girls in the West. Yeah, because I think it's seen as like, in, in, incorrectly, it's seen as something that happens to girls in Africa. It happens, not that that should matter anyway. It shouldn't number matter. Number one, but it happens to huge numbers of American and English girls, let, let alone all the other theaters Listen, in the world. Listen, in, till the 1960s, the West, you know, Europe and America, they had something called clidiotomy where there were doctors out there who believed if a woman was caught masturbating or having an orgasm, it was considered a mental health issue. So there were actually clinics here in the West that was actually removing women's clitorises. So it's just, we're just using a different language again. It was all the same thing, but I think there's something about if, because it's, it's seen as an African issue, it must be barbaric, these crazy people. Nobody wants to talk about white women who are doing something to their genitals. I mean, now, you know, after 15 years with myself and other campaigners out there, I mean, it's not just me. We're now seeing women from South Asian communities who are coming forward. We're seeing women from Russia, Colombia. This is, I mean, and I think in a way I feel kind of vindicate, vindicated through this because I've been saying it's not an African issue. It's not a Muslim issue. It's a women, it's a global issue. But fundamentally for me, it was to control women's sexuality. And this is where <laughs> the vagina talk really started because it was like, wait a minute, this is just a title. 
domestic violence, FGM, you know, early forced marriage, you know, sexual abuse. We were all convicted of this just because we were born with this genitalia. So for me, it was like, let's start the conversation from there and then work our way up because we need to acknowledge all this happened because we were born females. Let's, let's be honest about that. Yeah, this is a difficult subject to get people to actually care about. And even though it's so horrifying, I think it just, people are immediately take a step back. Um, and you're quite creative about how you grab attention. And you, were, you did a, an amazing documentary in the UK. Um, what was it called? So I presented uh, a documentary for the Channel 4 called The Crow Cut. Actually, that's the title of my talk in Oslo. Um, so this documentary, really, the aim was, number one, to teach the British public where FGM actually is, but mainly to remind him that this is happening to British girls. So the storyline was they were, they were following me in my work, but I didn't want to talk to community leaders. I'm not negotiating with community leaders about my body or my vagina, anything like that. I refuse to do it. They don't own it. Because by talking to them about it, then we, I'm giving them that power. So I'm going to the people who actually hold the power, which is the politicians. So at the time, our current prime minister was the home secretary. So we came up with creative ways. So we, we had a, a vagina booth in the middle of South Bank, which, as you know, is like one of the most busiest parts of London. So I was giving out these vulva cupcakes to the people in the <laughs> streets. Delicious, they were delicious. I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to break the bad news to them while feeding them. That was my aim. So I was like, I'm going to taste something really horrible, but have a cake while you do it. It's very British, right? Yes. But we also uh, created a vagina gallery because for me, this, the, talking about this with boys and men was so important because at the end of the day, FGM is done for men. And I felt men were being kept out of the conversation. This is when really it started for me to bring men into this. And I wanted men, genuinely, these young boys to know that women's genitals are all different in the first place. Because, you know, I thought, let me take the opportunity, because I know they're watching porn on YouTube. So I thought, let me take the opportunity to teach them about how women's genitals look like. But what I, one of the things that I did in that particular scene in the film, I performed FGM on these big, massive vulvas made out of clay clay With yes a giant needle a giant, giant needle so i literally started performing fgm and i mean one of them nearly passed passed out and they were so angry i and, and and for me i wanted him to be outraged out. <laughs> i mean yeah i wanted him to be outraged but i wanted something positive to come out of that and i think that's what happened because at the end of that they were saying we don't want any of our children to undergo something like this ever so for me that was really important for them to understand um, but there was another scene that was actually we weren't allowed to film, which we planned, which was we created a six foot vagina costume. So the plan was I was going to get a guy or myself to wear it and chase Theresa May down the street. Mm -hmm. I know people thought it was crazy for no. this idea, but you know, I, I thought I think we should still do it. I mean, it would be great to do this with Trump right now. Can you imagine after the pussy grabbing stories? I mean, it's now coming back to bite him. Let me tell you, can you imagine having that vagina tent outside <laughs> the White House and giving out vulva cupcakes? We won't call it vulva cupcakes, so we'll call it the pussy cupcakes. Make it happen. We I need think. to make it happen. Listen, people in the US need to help me make this happen. Like, we need to make this happen. Right, That's how we made change in the UK. Huh? We've both spoken to activists who are in the US, and the numbers aren't even known. Like, these yeah. girls either get taken back, or there's sometimes underground... Um, cutting that happens in the US and the UK yes, and Europe yes. all through the diaspora. I mean the women, I mean there are amazing campaigns, there's a great movement taking place in the US at the moment but I feel the biggest biggest struggle in the US at the moment I think because they have state laws so what happens in one state doesn't apply to another state so they have a bigger problem than I, I mean I was there in uh, this November, just after Trump was elected, what a great timing! And uh, it was a, a girl summit. So it was great. Utopia. Yeah, it was just. Yeah, it was just uh, yeah I've never seen. Uh, I've been to DC a couple of times, and I've never seen uh, a state so depressed in my life. I mean, you can, it was like a morgue that we, I walked into. But the campaigners who are currently working, actually, what it, I think maybe the good thing that came out of Trump, it just galvanized people. And actually, there are a bigger anti fj movement in the U.S. now than ever, and because of Trump. That has to happen because my worry is i mean as you know he's got he, he got rid of some of the funding that was specifically for that that money wasn't for something else it was specifically for that so i don't understand why he took it away right this is referring to uh the recent cuts to usaid and just when he gutted the state department and it's i, I it's uh we are talking about a misogynistic patriarchal system really that's what this is 
And that's what we are fighting. It's not FGM is just a, a headline in this, but that is what we are constantly fighting all the time. And maybe I came into this by trying to end FGM, but I, I've always said, you know, we cannot end FGM unless we end all forms of oppression against women and girls. We have policies out there that discriminate against us on a daily basis. And I always use the tampon taxing as an, as an example. The idea that my government makes money out of my menstrual cycle it's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, it really makes me angry every time I think about it because I didn't choose to have periods. I didn't choose to bleed or have menstrual cycle or have cramps and mood swings. I don't know if anyone does, but I have serious <laughs> mood swings. And, and they're making money out of it. Actually, recently in the UK, what happened? Uh, 250,000 pounds of that money went to an anti-abortion organization. So yeah, that's where we are in 2017. So the vagina talk will definitely continue. Like yes. to me, it comes back to that. It's because we were born with these genitals. And I like, <laughs> and I like that you're pushy about it. And because that's I why you have to be. I, listen, I mean, you, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that maybe I can take credit for in the UK was, I think we needed somebody from the community, somebody who's undergone the practice, who was not going to do BS. And I didn't care. I mean, when my mother watched the documentary, she was like, oh my God, we're going to be deported. <laughs> like, I didn't tell her all the information of the documentary until she actually watched it. She went, you went after the Home Secretary? Are you crazy? <laughs> But somebody needed to take that step and there was an inquiry that was launched because of that. And I think one of my strangest and best days of my life was watching the politicians that ignored me and I sat there and they had to answer to me, all of them. So that was, uh, yeah, that, that I can't wait to tell my grandchildren about that story. Because it was, it was, it was a really, it was a big deal in the UK and it was done by a survivor who brought this to the forefront. So it was, that was great. No, and hopefully by the time you have grandkids, it'll be like an old. Remember back in the day when we used to yeah, do that horrible absolutely. thing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's the story, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, right. you know, we brought these politicians to the forefront and we ended it. You know, <laughs> like, wouldn't right. that be a great story? Thank you so much for doing thank this, you. for talking to us and oh, get to talk about me. FGM not every day. <laughs>